Hey, I'm Logan Medish, your host of the High Caliber History Podcast, and this week is Thanksgiving week here in the United States, and so we're going to do something a little different and look at the guns of the first Thanksgivings. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the guns in the first century or so of our foothold here in North America. So we'll be looking uh, all through the 1600s and the guns there. So without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode today, uh, I would encourage you to please leave a review. Make sure you're subscribed or send it to someone that you think might enjoy it. That would definitely help us out. So you can't really talk about uh, the first Thanksgiving and things of that nature without talking about the Mayflower uh, and the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts with the Pilgrims. And it's recorded that there were at least 22 guns that came over on the Mayflower with, uh, with the Pilgrims there. And these would have been very early firearms. So we're going to be talking about, you know, things like match locks, uh, which are using match cord, which is a very early, very primitive type of firearm. And then we'll be talking about uh, the wheel lock firearms, which would have been the next iteration, which surprisingly was a, a much more complicated design than that of the match lock before it um, and was a very intricate lock mechanism but it was uh, a big leap forward from the matchlock. And then it's kind of funny because once we get into the 1700s, which we, we won't be delving into a whole lot in this episode, but then we get into things like the flintlock, which is a, a step backwards in terms of uh, complexity in the lock mechanism. But at any rate, so we're going to be dealing with at least 22 firearms coming over on the Mayflower into the, the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. Uh, there were a number of trading posts and outposts established in the area, uh, one of which was called the Marymount Trading Post, which is in the area of present-day Quincy, Massachusetts, and they had firearms available there uh, for trade to Native Americans in exchange for furs. And uh, it's recorded that on April 5th, 1631, there was a directive ordering every man to have one musket, one pound of gunpowder, 20 bullets, and 12 feet of match cord. And again, that's for the matchlock uh, firearms that they would have been using at that time. By 1635, there's been an interesting development. Of course, nothing runs without money. And so we're looking at bullets actually being used as a type of currency uh, in the, the Plymouth Colony and in the Massachusetts area up there. Um, of course, money of any kind, any hard currency is at an absolute premium. So it makes perfect sense that you would use something just as important, uh, the, the round balls, the lead balls for your firearms as currency. And this time period, they would have been carrying their firearms at church. And it made uh, a whole lot of sense because it was helped prevent gun theft during their public meetings, because just as it is today, you know, an empty house is a prime target. And this was uh, especially important in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1636. There was actually a directive that said, quote, come to the public assemblies with your muskets or other pieces fit for service upon pain of 12 pounds for every default. And that's a serious chunk of change uh, that the, the majority of colonists could not afford to spare. So it was certainly just easier and more convenient to just bring your musket or other piece fit for service to church with you uh, to help protect yourself and everybody else around you. Now we'll go back a little bit. Of course, when everyone thinks uh, early settlers and early pilgrims, they think of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But of course, we're here even earlier in the 1600s at Jamestown in Virginia, arriving in 1607. There are records there that note that the first firelocks, uh, which was a common term for all types of firearms at that point, uh, their first firelocks were majority of matchlock arms with some wheel locks uh, and then a very few snap haunches, which is an early form of flintlock. A couple of years later, in 1609, uh, the famous John Smith reports that there were 300 muskets, which was his term for matchlocks at that time, uh, snap haunches, which of course are early flintlocks, uh, 
and fire locks, which was the term for wheel locks at that time, uh, all at Jamestown. So we've got a total of 300 arms in Jamestown, uh, 1609. So just two years after they get there. And it's a combination of match locks, snap haunches, uh, and wheel locks. So uh, an interesting variety there just within the first couple of years. Moving beyond that, two years later in 1611, uh, it also in Jamestown still, it's noted that all musketeers must carry muskets and officers, including sergeants and corporals, must carry snap haunches or fire locks. So it's neat to note here that depending on your rank uh, as a musketeer, it determined what kind of firearm you were supposed to be carrying in the Jamestown colony. By 1624, there were a total of 1,089 firearms listed in the colony. And then we jump ahead 50 years uh, in 1676, and there are accounts that relate that everyone is now using flintlock arms of some kind, and there are no matchlocks being used. Uh, the use of the matchlock was not abandoned in Europe until the early 1700s, but the conditions in the New World dictated the use of a more sophisticated arm a little bit earlier. And my favorite quote uh, coming out of the Jamestown area uh, in Virginia in the uh, 17th century comes from the Auditor General of the Colonies, William Blathwaite. He says, quote, there is no custom more generally to be observed by the young Virginians than that they all learn to keep and use a gun with marvelous dexterity as soon as they have strength enough to lift it to their heads. I just thought that was a, a really cool statement there. Uh, the colonists, when they come over here, the early pilgrims, they are encouraged to bring hunting guns with them from England. Uh, there is a, a newspaper advertisement in 1622 that says, quote, bring every man a musket or fowling piece. Let your piece be long in the barrel. Of course, that's the longer the barrel, the more accurate it's going to be because we're dealing with smoothbore guns. Uh, so let your piece be long in the barrel and fear not the weight of it, for most of our shooting is from stands. And then in 1628, they're making uh, an interesting observance of the types of hunting that they're doing. And they say, quote, sometimes we take birds by surprise and fire amongst them with hail shot. Immediately, 60, 70 and 80 of them fall, which is just a, a stunning amount of firepower and a stunning amount of birds uh, that they were absolutely in need of in order to maintain the sustenance of the people in the colony. Uh, but of course, that's an absolute atrocity when you're dealing with uh, conservation standards that we're looking at today. But of course, they were just trying to trying to survive. So it was a little bit different for them. In the early decades of the 17th century in the 1600s, um, generally speaking, Native Americans were prohibited from owning guns. There were stiff penalties for the colonists who supplied guns to the natives. In Massachusetts in 1652, that penalty was whipping and cheek branding. And in Virginia in 1657, the penalty was the forfeiture of your entire estate if you were found guilty. So they were not messing around. There's uh, surveys that were done throughout the colonies uh, during these time periods, one of which comes out of Essex County in Massachusetts in the 14-year period between 1636 and 1650. And it's an interesting note that firearms ownership was not limited by gender. Of course, there are a lot of strict gender roles and responsibilities at this time, uh, given the, the political climate and the religious climate in the world. But firearm ownership was a little bit different, especially when you're here on the frontier and it can often be a difference of life and death. So in that survey from those years in Essex County, 71% of the male population owned a firearm and 25% of the women owned a firearm. Moving south a little bit, uh, we come into Tidewater, Maryland, and during the course of 1656 to 1719, a total of 604 probate inventories were surveyed. Now, a probate inventory is the, the amount of items found in your estate after you pass away uh, to figure out the total value of your estate and, and help settle any debts you have and, and move things along like that. And so during the course of these 604 inventories between 1656 and 1719, 
it was noted that 78% of the households had firearms in them. Uh, we'll also take a look at Surrey County, Virginia, again with probate inventories between 1690 and 1715. There were a total of 221 inventories done and 66% of the middle class households had firearms and 74% of the wealthiest households had firearms. Um, but the funny thing there is that only 4% of the households had knives of any kind. Um, that's, of course, including eating utensils. Uh, the looking further in depth into those inventories in Surrey County, you realize that firearms are more prevalent in homes than on uh, tables, chairs, hoes, axes, and knives. So you may not have a way to cut down a tree and you may not have a chair to sit at or a table to eat at, but you've got a firearm, which is uh, very interesting. In Providence, Rhode Island, we're looking between 1679 and 1726, and we're looking at a total of 149 inventories there, 63% of which have at least one firearm in the home. And the really interesting takeaway here is that firearms are more common than all forms of lighting. We're talking candles, lanterns, candlesticks, things of that nature. 63% have a firearm, only 60% have any kind of a lighting device, which is a very big deal when you're talking uh, this time period. We are centuries away from electric lighting, and it was yet still deemed slightly more important to have a firearm in your household than it was uh, to have any kind of a candle. Of course, this is just a snapshot in time. This is uh, not a, an examination of everywhere in the early colonies. Um, but it gives you an interesting insight into the types of firearms that were there at early Thanksgivings uh, of all sorts and types. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have households that have matchlocks in them and households that have snap haunches in them and households with wheel locks. And, you know, those guns might be hanging over the hearth while they're carving a Thanksgiving turkey or perhaps a Thanksgiving side of beef or a ham or pheasants or whatever it is that they're just thankful to have uh, at that point in time. Now, another interesting Thanksgiving firearm related topic that I want to talk about is uh, the one of the firearms that is purported to have come over on the Mayflower. And I mentioned that a total of 22 guns came over on the Mayflower. And generally speaking, we have no idea where those guns ended up. Their whereabouts today are unknown. But there is one firearm that we do know the whereabouts of, uh, and it, it is said to have come over on the Mayflower with Pilgrim John Alden, and it was supposedly hidden in the walls of the house that he had there in Massachusetts that was owned by the family for a very long time, and it was discovered there in the early 20th century, and it was actually at one point donated to the National Firearms Museum in Fairfax, Virginia. I found this absolutely fascinating for a number of reasons. One is because I worked there. If you've listened to the earlier episodes in this show, you know that I worked at the National Firearms Museum for about five years. And that gun was always a fascinating piece of history. Um, really interesting gun to study. Of course, being a wheel lock, it has uh, an exceptionally complicated mechanism, which fascinated me. And also based on the markings that were found on the backside of the lock and on the barrel, it's believed that the gun was actually Italian in origin and actually linked uh, most likely to the Beretta factory. Well, not a factory at that time, but the Beretta family, which is the oldest continuously operating firearms company in the world. Um, so that's that's a fascinating piece there. And I became more and more intrigued by the history of this gun. And uh, as a researcher, you're, you're often happy to, to fall down the rabbit hole researching something and trying to figure out all of the background material that you can to get the whole story. And, and it's often a lot of fun. And so I wanted to find all the documentation I could on this Mayflower gun. And as I delved into the records and the resources that were available in the archives at the museum there, uh, it, it was interesting how all of the documentation unfolded. Now, the gun came to the museum in the very early years of its founding in the 1930s. And uh, one of the things that is very common for a lot of museums in the early 20th century uh, or even before then is that your, your documentation is sparse at best. Uh, 
And unfortunately, that's what I found with the Mayflower gun. There are a lot of instances uh, that that gun has been cited in print and certainly a ton more that that gun has been cited online as having come over on the Mayflower with John Alden found in the house in the early 20th century and then donated. But I wanted to know the provenance of the gun, not just the story and the, the family lore behind the gun. And unfortunately, the evidence went in a giant circle. Uh, one story cited another, which cited another, and you tracking them back and forth and trying to find them. And it all came back to the same very early stories coming out of the museum in the 1930s, which of course were based on the family lore. So it may or may not have come over on the Mayflower. It may or may not have been present at the earliest, one of the earliest Thanksgivings in the New World. But at any rate, it's a very cool firearm uh, that certainly dates from that period and, and possibly being a very early Beretta is really cool nonetheless. Um, so if you have a chance to see that firearm, it's very cool um, in its own right. If not, take a look at it online. There's, there's great photos of it on their website. Um, but it is certainly representative of the types of firearms that would have been seen in households all throughout the colonies, you know, from, from as far north as the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts and down into Virginia, all up and down the earliest footholds that we had here in the New World in the early 17th century. You're going to see guns like that, matchlocks and early snap haunts, flintlock designs, and of course the, the even earlier uh, matchlocks. Uh, so matchlocks, wheelocks, snap haunches, they're, they're the earliest designs that you're going to see here. And they absolutely uh, all would have had very important places in the home during the Thanksgiving feast uh, in the, the 17th century. So I hope you enjoyed this kind of quick episode, this quick recap of what you would have found in the 17th century in the earliest Thanksgiving homes. What's um, hanging over the hearth or propped up next to the door while you're carving your turkey or your side of beef or whatever else you have there. Um, so often the firearms are just as prevalent in the home today as they were then, um, serving slightly different purposes and they, they look a little bit different, but uh, it's still cool to see that tradition here in the new world, the United States, uh, all these years later, some 400 plus years later, uh, 400 plus for Jamestown and 400 uh, this year, 1620 to 2020 with the, uh, the Plymouth Colony. So very, very neat stuff. I hope you enjoyed this episode again. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you and, and we'll be back soon. <laughs>